let's make, try to make this a little bit more interactive. Uh, where, sh where should we take this in terms of conversations about social media? We can talk more about all kinds of technical details there in terms of the moral psychology element, in terms of I've offended you and you just want to lash out, in terms of I'm a horrible person because I sort of criticized Aristotle. Uh, let's, 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 let's move over to, to Q&A. Wonder if you have some thoughts on um, real life and your social media life and kind of like authenticity Many. and integrity and a continuum. Um, you know, what, what uh, media channels are, you know, would you, would you prefer one over another? Would you use uh, a mixture of them according to different things? Does it depend on the person? Um, what are some ideas that one would keep in mind in, in thinking like, am I the same person um, in the media channels I use to communicate? Mm -hmm. Great question. The, uh, where to begin though? I have, the, I have this, this conversation a lot because anybody can cite examples of people using social media technology in a way that is sucking their soul. I mean, these are the, you, you, you've seen somebody with a phone and it's like the Dementor out of Harry Potter. You're just, it's, 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 it's taking away who you are. You're, you're pouring everything that you have of yourself into it and all the fantastic pictures of teenagers at the mall sitting around a table with their friends texting other people. I think Americans have tended to be tended to fall into one of two camps. One, the first camp, and it's a very small camp, are the ones that are very skeptical of new technologies. Um, tends to be whoever is on the older side at that particular time that that technology is invented, uh, the subset of that, the, that group. The other group tends to unquestioningly accept whatever technology is placed in front of it. Sweet, there's a new iPhone. It's the same as the last one, but I have to have it. Um, that group, I have a lot of food allergies, and I, it's been fascinating looking at the history of the way that Americans, American capitalism, American government have, have treated food. The number of things that we've been told unequivocally are horrible for you. Don't eat them, only to be told 10 years later, oops, we were wrong. You have to have a lot of that. Or let's all eat foods that, if you look at the ingredients, three quarters of the, the ingredients aren't food. And then we wonder why we all have gluten sensitivities and, and whatnot. We, we just tend to accept whatever's put in front of us. And in my experience, with social media, when it's uncritically accepted, there's just something about a screen that can be addictive, especially if your, your actual real life social life is lacking. At their best though, social media can, can do what they were designed to do, which is empower your real life social life and strengthen uh, your community it can be that, that easy way of knowing quickly, I have five friends who can all go to the movies with me tonight, or God forbid, go out for drinks and actually talk. I, I said I was gonna talk about Instagram. Uh, I have really mixed feelings about Instagram on this score because it allows you to, well, first of all, I just get tired of watching everyone else's food. <laughs> Is it just me? This is what I made for dinner, that's great. Um, but a lot of the social media channels, and this is true of the, the visual ones in particular, allow you to present this, this whitewashed version of yourself to the outside world, and I think that's part of what you were getting at. You can, you can create a dynamic where you have real you and then you have social media you. And that's not even the avatar concept from Second Life or something, it's, 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 it's the notion that you have this whitewashed version of you that people see. I think at their best, social media have to be used like any other technology, a tool that has potentially good and bad effects. Uh, I don't know that I'd quite go so far as to say it's morally neutral, but it's morally neutral enough that we have to think about how is this how is this used to enhance and further community rather than replacing it? And I could go on for hours with all kinds of little rabbit trails there, but I'll pause there. Matt. So, so you mentioned that as 
further conversations in the future come up, we need to try and have those conversations in a broader narrative. I might have missed this, but how do you suggest widening that narrative that is confined to the, you're either the Little Mermaid or Triton? Prevailing wisdom goes that widening the narrative requires finding a, a, a value point that involves common ground between the two of you. So you have a, to use very crude terms, a, a conservative who opposes gay marriage because he has this notion of what marriage ought to be or because he thinks it's bad for society. Maybe it's purely utilitarian. And on the other hand, you have uh, someone who supports gay marriage who sees it in terms of marriage equality. If, you, if they just approach it like this, there's, there's no way they're ever going to be reconciled, right? They're at totally opposite ends of what's going on. Um, but if you think about it in terms of what common ground do they have? Are there, are there values they both share? And the, the Disney example was a decent one here. There, are, there are, are values that entire generations are raised with or entire groups of people are raised with or that groups that are on opposite sides of a fence in a particular area uh, share in, in, in one area and not in another. So I would think about it in terms of finding a core value, something that has a strong emotional tug, something that you can build a narrative around. Uh, one that I've seen with regard to the, the marriage issue, and I haven't fully thought this one through, but I've seen it, uh, is, is an orphan question. Um, in fact, Focus on the Family is doing some of this, so actually working with uh, some organizations they'd historically been pitted against. Uh, and my understanding is they've actually been working together with them on some, some common issues, things they can both get passionate about on the same side of the fence. I don't have a ton of great examples beyond that. Ryan, keep me in check here, because um, I assume that Instagram was a point of this that you wanted to create this conversation around. Do you mind if I take a quick survey and just find out who in the room has an Instagram account? What do we call that, like 25%, 50%? So um, in terms of interactive media, there's a kind of a conventional wisdom that Instagram is this cliche of taking pictures of your dinner. But we all know that a picture is worth a thousand words. And that the real conversation that's taking place with Instagram isn't the subject itself, but the curation of the subjects. And you'd made a mention earlier about don't be the guy that gets into fights on Facebook. But I found that whether you're talking um, chat rooms or Twitter or Insta any of this stuff, you really end up curating the fights that you champion. Sometimes you choose popular causes, sometimes you choose unpopular causes, and people come to look at you as a thought leader, and I hope that leads back to why you chose Instagram as the topic of your conversation. Uh, it doesn't. I chose Instagram because if I, five years ago the talk would have been how Facebook is changing it, but apparently that's waning. Uh, not cool anymore. But, but I like the larger point that, that you're making. This is this point of content curation. It's not just about the one thing that you post, the one picture of your dinner. It's, uh, it's the notion of building up an identity that I've, well, of the genius at this and is relevant to this issue is George Takei, Star Trek guy. And he is a genius with social media. Probably 80% of what he posts is just funny. It's just a little meme. It's just, it's, it's, it's something that is, is, is worth sharing. And this is a huge part of the way social media works. It's, and, and, and I have a lot of difficulty uh, sometimes getting clients to wrap their mind around this. It's not just about dumping your content out of social media. It's about creating something that's worth sharing, social media. So I create this picture, or I write this article, or share this article someone else wrote, whatever it is. Uh, I want to, share, to do something in such a way that the people I have a direct connection to share it with the people I have an indirect connection to. And this goes back to the, the social media version of reflecting our social psychology. We're going to affect people we don't even know by the sharing of sharing of sharing. Uh, so a lot of, yeah, and, and this is where I get a little wary of, of, of a black and white, 
how to use social media to champion traditional marriage or something like that kind of conversation. Because it really is about a lot more than harping on a particular issue. If you want to be an effective ambassador for anything on social media, you have to be willing to engage people who disagree with you. You have to be willing to post things that are uh, quote unquote off topic. This, this freaks some of my clients out. I'm, a, I'm a, a food charity and you want me to post a cute picture of a cat? It has nothing to do with my mission. This is bad, bad nonprofit marketing in the old school world, but it's good nonprofit marketing in the Facebook world where I can, I can share that cute picture and I get 30 likes on it and 80 new people are introduced to my organization and maybe they see the next thing I post which is on topic. Where should I go from there? Where am I going as far as honing in on what you wanted to talk about? I could be a gadfly if you want to kind of get this thing going. Be is a that I'm it. I'm a I'm an acolyte of of a media theorist. Maybe he's been debunked by now, but I don't care. I love him. Is Marshall McLuhan, and the medium being the message. I have found that social media, contrary to pretty much your concept of it, is not um, to empower us. It's an act. It's actually designed in its inherent design to enslave us, to uh, conform us, to cause us to be um, not liberated, but in fact enslaved by a mentality that Im imposes its will on us. And so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, the, the phenomena of mobbing is something that many of this in the room choosing unpopular causes has been subject to and social media is, is fomenting this in more ways than others. Uh, does that spark any kind of conversational direction? I hope so. Several. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a great that's a great way direction to take this actually. The the this is the fascinating thing about any kind of media. You're going to create different kinds of content for that media. You're going to care about, learn to care about different things, talk about different things, express yourself in different ways because you're being shaped by that particular media's approach. Um, this is one where I, I like to bash the 20th century a little bit in, in, in this conversation because the way that we approached everything from uh, business to government, or consuming business products anyway, to government to media was so two-way. It was very much about well, TV, for example, it's, it's such a passive communications medium. Someone on the, the other end can say something and millions of people see it. And there's all, there are all kinds of fun thoughts about the, the way that you could control people's minds. Or you even go back to the newspapers uh, and look at some of the great newspaper magnets of the late 19th, early 20th centuries, people able to show people how to think. You can't do that as easily on social media because there are more voices. As polarized as they are, there are more voices and there is an opportunity for someone to hold up their hand and say, hang on a second. But there is still a very real sense that if, these, if, 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 if a tool is used in a particular way to replace, and this goes back to our, our conversation a moment ago, to replace real life instead of to empower and improve real life, you, it is very easy to become enslaved to it. I, I know a number of people who gave up Facebook, actually a lot of people in my generation just gave up Facebook, either for a specific period of time, a lot of them do it for Lent, lasts about a week. Um, but some of, them, some of them actually give it up totally and have not been, been back since. And they do it because they became enslaved by it. And they could just, they couldn't stop giving themselves to it. I don't know that I can blame Facebook for that though. I'm more inclined to uh, blame their lack of self-discipline. But there's all kinds of, of directions you could go with that, so pause it there. Dr. Lopez. Uh, I'm wondering if, um, if we have a, it, it, let's say that we have a team of people who are trying to maybe move public opinion or get a, a discussion going on something. Um, is it possible that there are some people whose gifts are just more predisposed to certain kinds of media than to others, because I feel like I'm, I've never started a blog that didn't hit a thousand hits a day within two weeks. I don't, I'm really good at blogging. Can we talk? I get, I get everybody like, you know, um, you know, I can't do Twitter 
I tried really hard at one point. I just can't do Twitter. I can't do Facebook. I, I fall flat on my face. I don't, I can't get involved in the comment sections on almost anything. Like I've tried to because I've, I've read up on the social media strategies and I always felt like, you know, I have to get with the thing. But maybe it's just that some of us are really good at the Twitter and they can tweet. And then some of us just have to be kind of, we have to put our talent where we can add to the conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about that. How you think? I'm no, I definitely agree. People, different people are different for the same reason that somebody who might be a good uh, talking head for a cable show might be a horrible writer. Uh, I've seen this to stick with the Twitter example. Uh, one of my favorite writers is Rod Dreher, who's on Twitter, uh, but his primary skill is blogging as well. He'll write three, four really long blog posts a day, and people devour it. Um, no idea what kind of traffic he generates for the American conservative compared to everyone else, but I suspect it's a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and he's on Twitter, and he's decently active, but he's not, he's not conversational. Uh, he has a lot of followers, though, because he's a good writer. He's, people care about his ideas. There's a sense in which he doesn't need, he needs to be on social media as a way of letting people who are on social media know that he's written something new, but he doesn't need to be on it to build his own brand. He doesn't need to be on it to for new people to find out about him. He's already got an established audience. Uh, for others, social media is a way of, of building that brand. They, they start the blog and they don't have a thousand hits a day within two weeks. Uh, and those people, and they tend to be extroverts, uh, are willing to wade into conversations. They're willing to look at a hashtag, top conservative tweeters or gay marriage or Barack Obama or whatever it is, and they're willing to actually discuss things about it. And the people that I know who have 30,000 plus followers on Twitter tend to be those people. You look at their, their, their tweets, you look at their feeds, and it's not, most of their tweets are not, my latest article, here you go. It's, thanks Johnny, that was a good comment, or this random stuff, because they're just having a conversation and they, they like that. They're the same people who would be the life of the party at a cocktail party. Uh, and I've heard plenty of people compare Twitter to a cocktail party. You sell your product or you market your cause not by going in and saying, buy my product. You go in by networking, joining a conversation. Some people love that and some people like me don't like it at all. Do you think our, our side needs to hire more sock puppets or whatever they call meat puppets? Because I know the other side employs whole you know, casts of people who go in as emergency response teams you know, in the comment section, like an American thinker, if you, if you watch that, um, if you look at that blog, that website, every time there's an article on gay marriage, um, typically it's critical of gay marriage, and at 9 a.m. you'll have, I don't know, 50 articles that are all supportive of the author, and then you know immediately when the emergency response teams have kicked in, and then all of a sudden you'll have 300 comments from pro-gay marriage, people who completely bury everything, they, they manipulate the likes and the dislikes to get certain comments at the top. I mean, is it to the point where we just need to hire paid manipulators? I mean, as much as I hate to do it, I'm just curious. If I gotta be honest, I'm really skeptical of the value of that strategy. I don't know anyone who reads comments at the end of articles except sometimes the author. I know people, a lot of people who write them. Well, they seem to have uh, like, like thousands of likes or dislikes or, you know, and sometimes it's, although a lot of times, yeah, the comments are either two people going on to 500 people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and you don't, in, in many uh, blogging type contexts, comment feeds, uh, well, and pretty much all social media, everyone always says, why doesn't have Facebook have a dislike button? There's a very good reason for the fact that Facebook doesn't have a dislike button, which is they want to generate attention. Their business model wants to use what you interact with to show you more of what you would like so that you will see more of what you like there and want to keep coming back and using their product. So uh, there's, there's a very real sense in social media where all publicity is good publicity. Because people, if people are commenting, if you have 900 comments on your article, that's a good thing because that's helping you in Google search engine algorithms. That's helping you with uh, the number of people who are seeing it on Facebook. You're, every, every person who comments on that uh, piece critically is showing it to more people. Uh, and especially, I think, if you're, if you're approaching a particular topic in a way that, and, and you did this absolutely brilliantly today, that just subverts everyone's pre-existing pre notions and narratives and uh, forces them to look at it in a whole new way. 
you get 900 negative comments, that means hundreds of thousands of people on both sides of the aisle have now seen your argument. They wouldn't otherwise have seen it. So that's my thought on that. Kaylin. Um, thanks so much for your remarks. I don't know how much time we have, but I, I just wanted to ask a couple minutes, I think. possibly possibly last question. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on a phenomenon that I think a lot of us witnessed uh, right around this time last year um, when the human rights campaign obviously did its very, very effective Facebook um, campaign. I, I, I don't know if you mentioned that at the beginning of the talk. I was outside nope. for briefly. Um, and so for those that maybe don't remember, this was the, the day that your newsfeed was completely covered in red equal signs. Does this sound familiar? Yes. Okay. So, so I've read sort of subsequent to that that the reason that that was so effective is because it it shows what is normal, and it made everyone who's you know social media world is of course um, you know especially for young people is is you know skewed left leaning, um, and and you know in particular on this issue, um, and so what it what it did was that it showed um, it made everyone think that oh everyone in my social network must support same-sex marriage, when in fact this was not true. It's just that the, the people who didn't happen to support same-sex marriage weren't on Facebook that day, or, or they, weren't, they weren't en masse on Facebook in the same way. Um, but, that, uh, but, but what I read subsequent to that was, was that showing what is normal is much more effective than telling what should be. Yep. Um, and so I was just wondering, you know, if you could comment on using Facebook, even just in our own personal lives, to to demonstrate that, hey, we, you know, it is still a normal and accepted viewpoint, you know, to, to have the, the the commitments that we have to to marriage and and sexual integrity. Um, so I wonder if you might comment on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. I actually, I mentioned that earlier in, in a non-social media context, but this is another case where the way people work in real life is no different from the way they work on social media. Their real lives are just extended onto social media, but to a large extent. The, that was also a great case of, we could talk all day about the kinds of things that tend to catch on. Um, there are some unique twists to, that are unique to social media, but by and large, the things that inspire people to share them with other people are things that are that that appeal to certain emotions appeal to emotion like awe or, or humor um, and and this is a case where they knew the value system was there they knew that they had a huge audience uh, that was ready to accept this and and they gave them a chance to see what they could do I've seen I've seen organizations struggle with social media for ages unable to get more than a couple likes for anything, and then they actually go out on a limb and deliver a well-placed ask, hey, we need your help, we're trying to accomplish this, we're trying to get whatever it is, 30,000 likes by midnight or whatever, and it's a cause that, that resonates with enough people and it's seen as urgent enough. We can make a difference, we can shape what other people think is normal, and all of a sudden it takes off. Uh, and that's really the example you gave is one of the best examples I've seen of that. We are out of time, so we'll have to call it a day. Thank you so much.